message begins with a man and a wife and a mother-in-law. And it was the mother-in-law's dying wish on her bucket list to visit the Holy Land before she passed away. So the man made it happen. Him, his wife, and his mother-in-law made their way to the Holy Land. Unfortunately, the mother-in-law passed away. The funeral director responded and said to the man, listen, sorry for your loss. You have two options. You can pay $5,000 and we can ship the body home. Or for $50, you can bury her here in the Holy Land. The man, without thinking, he said, I'll take the $5,000 option. The funeral director was stunned. In private, he said, excuse me, sir, I've never had anybody take that offer considering the price range, the price gap. You seem to have had your mind made up. Can you tell me why? I said, listen, I know where I'm at. About 2,000 years ago, there was a man who died here. They buried him, and three days later, he got up from that grave. And I'm not taking any chances. I think it's appropriate to say that my relationship with my mother-in-law is excellent. <laughs> but that's the truth. There was a man, a God man, who about 2,000 years ago, he was killed, crucified, buried, and then three days later, he rose from the grave. Do you know who I'm talking about? This man, his birthday, his existence changed Time, as we measure it, went from BC to AD because of his birth. But more than that, his death and his resurrection is also the determination of where you will spend eternal time. Do you know him? Do you know this great truth, the greatest truth of all time? Paul would write to a church in Corinth and he would say to them, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. There are the two camps, those that are believing in vain, coming up short, and those that are believing, standing, and holding fast to their faith. It's not a blind faith. It's a faith you can see. It's factual faith. It's a faith that is based upon the life of Jesus, his death, and of course, his resurrection. Here's the goal, and I'll tell you up front what I'm after, the assignment that I'm on, to make sure the gospel of Jesus Christ truly lives inside of you and that you truly live out the gospel. When I say live out the gospel, I'm talking about living out of the gospel, living out of the substance and the source of the gospel, that we would come to a conclusion that we know him and the power of his resurrection. Do you know this Jesus that I am speaking of? If you know him, you will know you are forgiven. If you know him, you will know that he is risen. Those two facts will cause the believer to be humble and hopeful, humbled by the bloody cross and hopeful through the empty tomb. Here's my question. In a world of many lies, do you know the greatest truth of all time? Do you know it? You know, this truth is the fountainhead of life and liberty. And that is why there is a very real enemy who wants to connive, who uses cunning tactics to blind the minds of many. I tell you the truth. Churches are packed today throughout our land. And yet many minds are blinded because they've not come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, one of the ways the enemy falsifies this truth. He's okay with you coming to church. He's okay for you to say he is risen and the appropriate refrain, he is risen indeed. He's okay with that. He's not okay with you receiving the greatest truth of all time, whereas you can say he is risen in me. Amen. Have you ever made that proclamation that he is risen in me, that he lives in me. Another way he falsifies this truth, other than religion, he wants to convince humanity that this faith stuff is a fairy tale, that it is nothing but a fable, that if you believe this is foolishness, 
that faith cannot be proven. Trust the science, they say. Well, I am. I followed the science. The verdict is in. The forensic evidence is available. From tracing the blood of the crucifixion to going to the tomb and seeing there's a body and it's missing. Oh, this evidence is provable. It's not only true, it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, which is why as I convey this message, I pray, so help me God. Paul would write, for I delivered to you, first of all, of utmost importance, first priority, that which I also received. Do you see it? We cannot give what we do not have. Paul is saying, I am giving it, delivering it, because I have it. You cannot give mercy if you do not have mercy. You cannot give grace if you do not have grace. You cannot give truth if you do not have truth. You cannot preach and live the gospel if you've not received, died to self, to live to Christ. Notice he says our sins have been paid for. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. In other words, this message is substantiated by a written record. It is provable. You know, Genesis 3.15, Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 22, Psalm 69, Isaiah 53, its entire chapter, Daniel 9, verses 24 to 26, Zechariah 13.7, just to name a few. And I don't expect you to remember that, but you gotta know it is according to the scriptures. It is written that Christ died for, here's the emphasis, our sins. If we don't own our involvement in his death, we will never grasp the atonement of his death. I'll say it a little bit differently. Before we can see the cross as something done for us, we must first recognize the cross as something done by us. Done for, done by. See, we're guilty. Romans tells us guilty is charged. All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glorious standard of God. And that is why the first step in this journey is to accept the charge of guilt. The verdict is in. Jesus actually addresses two types of people. In Luke chapter 18, he juxtaposes what is known as a Pharisee, let's just say somebody who was religious, and a tax collector, an outcast, a heathen, a sinner. Jesus begins by telling a parable about those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and, listen to this, prayed thus with himself. Praying with himself, he said, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Oh, that is the substance of the self-righteous. Those that think they're good can get them to God. And I'm here to tell you this morning, and I will not lie to you, that your good cannot get you to God. Your resume, your church attendance, your giving record, none of that means anything to a holy God. Do you know him? He then highlights the tax collector standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Alaskama. It's Greek for mercy. It's related to the other Greek form of it, halasmos. When you look it up, you find the word propitiation. In 1 John 2, 2, it says, he himself, Jesus, is the halasmos, the propitiation. Wait, what? Yeah, the tax collector in the parable gives us the equation of salvation. There are three components, God, mercy, halasmos, sinners. And without halasmos, mercy, the wrath of God would rightly be 
imputed upon sinful man. This was the concept of the entire Old Testament with the mercy seat, where a sacrifice was placed on the mercy seat, where the blood would be shed on the mercy seat. And here the tax collector, he speaks the truth of salvation. God, mercy, me. And if it wasn't for the mercy of God between us and him, all of us in this room would be destined to eternal damnation. He is the propitiation. Interestingly, there are certain churches today, even now, that won't mention any of these terms so as not to isolate or offend anyone. Well, here's the newsflash. Without understanding those terms, the wrath of God, the blood of Calvary, people are already isolated and alienated from a holy God. So we must discuss that the propitiation for our sins is the fact that Jesus not only appeased the wrath of God, Jesus absorbed the wrath of God. He paid your sin debt in full. Now you gotta understand this, I'll say it again, before you can see the cross as something done for you, you must come to terms that the cross was something done by you. Several weeks ago, my wife and I celebrated the third birthday of my son, Ezekiel. Now, no doubt any other day on the calendar would still warrant the celebration of his birthday. The date was March 7th. That's his birthday. Had his birthday been April 15th, we'd still celebrate it for the blessing and the miracle of his life. But you see on March 7th, there's something undergirding his birthday, which causes his father to appreciate the miracle even more. See, it was that day in 2009 where I was recklessly responsible for an at-fault drunk driving fatality which resulted in the death of a man named Hort Cap. Now do you understand the same day, a death day became a birthday. So I can enjoy and appreciate and be humbled by what was done for me simply because of the fact that I recognized that same day was something done by me. This is the cross. If you believe the cross is something done by you, you will appreciate the power and the grace of that sacrifice which was done for you. Oh, but that's just part of the story. It tells us in verse four that he was buried. This is the part of the gospel that is often overlooked. We, saw, we talk about that Christ died, the cross, and that he rose again, the tomb. We rarely give emphasis to the fact that he was buried. What is this all about? Isaiah 53, nine says, they made his grave with the wicked. Prophecy fulfilled on the cross next to two criminals, but with the rich at his death. What is this about? A man named Joseph of Arimathea, gave his own tomb, a wealthy man, to fulfill this prophecy. The religious mind wants to know a sign. How can I believe this is true? This is what they asked of Jesus. Give us a sign, they said. Jesus answered in Matthew 12, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. The non-believing world wants a sign. If it's real, if it's true, show me a sign. Jesus says to that question, here's the sign, the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Think about that. Jonah absolutely ended up in the belly of a great fish. This was a result of his personal consequence. He went the other way based on what God instructed him to go do. Now, it was personal consequence, but when you know what's happening in the scriptures, it was also divine providence that Jonah would be swallowed by a, a whale and be there for three days and three nights just so Jesus can one day come along and use his life as an illustration. How you like that? See, the point is this, because Christ was buried for your sins, you do not have to be buried by your sins. And there are plenty of people who hear these truths 
and yet still they are buried by their sins. Or similarly, they bury their sins. To bury and suppress our sins, to not confess that we are sinners. You know, what begins is an anthill. The moment I've sinned against God and I recognize it, I confess it, he forgives me from it. But if we don't, that anthill turns to a molehill, gets a little bit bigger. And that molehill, not confessed, becomes an actual hill. And there are many that are buried by their sins, the regrets of their past. And they become like little Lisa. You know, little Lisa who lost her itty bitty goldfish. She decided to bury it in her backyard with a shovel, digging a hole. She placed that goldfish in the ditch. A neighbor peering over the fence said, excuse me, little Lisa, what are you doing? She said, I'm burying my goldfish, it died. The neighbor said, wow, that's an awfully big hole for a little bitty goldfish. As she patted down the final heap of dirt, she said, well, yeah, that's because it's inside your stupid cat. <laughs> and because I am absolutely not a cat person, I am sorry that I am not sorry. And I don't find any fault with little Lisa, but I can find fault with us if we bury our sins, which goes as a slap in the face of a living God. You see, Christ died for your sins. He was buried, and then here's the part that is trustworthy, that he rose again the third day. You see, if the cross is the payment, the empty tomb is the receipt. If the cross is what secured it, the empty tomb is what assured it. The resurrection is proof positive that Jesus conquered death, that death died in Christ. That's a profound thought, that death did not take Jesus. Jesus, he took death. That's scriptural, 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. This is why the believer has a hope that transcends because Jesus got up from that grave according to the scriptures. Again, grounded in written record. Psalm 16, verse 10, everyone knew that the Holy One would not see corruption. Jesus himself said, if you destroy this temple, speaking of his body, I will rebuild it in three days. Fulfilling the prophecy, Jesus always mentioned the fact that he would be risen from the dead every single time he mentioned he would be crucified on the cross. Won't find a single mentioning of the cross without him alluding to he got up from that grave. What I'm trying to get you to see is our faith is not based on fables. Our faith is not based on feelings. Our faith is based on facts. I've told you before that 27% of this book from Genesis to Revelation is prophetic, 27%. Not a single percentage of any other holy book can be said to be prophetic, that God spoke it and it happened exactly as he predicted or prophesied through man. This is remarkable, 27% came across another fact it was said by Jordan Peterson. He referenced the Word of God as the first hyperlinked book. I thought that was pretty profound. What is a hyperlink? In the digital age, you click on a hyperlink and it takes you somewhere else in the book. It takes you to somewhere that's confirming or affirming or expounding upon a previously mentioned truth. There are 65,000 cross-references or hyperlinks in the Word of God. Let me say that again. 65,000 cross-references, 65,000 cross-references in the Word of God. The Bible is true in a very strange way. It's true in that it provides the basis for truth itself. And so it's like a meta-truth 
Without it, there couldn't even be the possibility of truth. All of that Old Testament meaning is coming into one moment in time with Jesus. What you're looking at is a visualization of the Bible. Every single one of those lines is a biblical verse. Now, the length of the line is proportionate to how many times that verse is referred to in some way by some other verse. So you say, well, this is the first hyperlinked book. And there's 65,000 cross-references, and that's what this map shows. And so that's a great visual representation of the book. And then you can see, well, why is it deep? Why is the book deep? Well, just imagine how many pathways you could take through that. You just journey through that forever. You'd never, ever get to the end of it. So, you know, to be people of the book, biblical truth is the sort of truth that is the precondition for truth. Not merely true, but the precondition for truth itself. It's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if I wanted to find out what type of lives were lived by those who saw Jesus alive, Paul goes out of his way to make sure we're aware of those who saw Jesus when he rose from the dead. Verse five tells us in that he was seen by Cephas, this is Peter, and then by the 12. This is a general title to the original 12 disciples. We know that all of them, but John, John was the youngest of the 12, all of them deserted Jesus and Peter denied him. And yet here the Lord shows himself to those guys. See, these guys would be the eyewitnesses of the greatest event in human history. They would be eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think it's important to note that when Paul writes this, it's only 20 years post the resurrection. 20 years where people would have been still alive, where word of mouth would have carried forth. Why does Paul isolate Peter here? Why did Jesus isolate Peter? Now, if you know anything about Peter and Jesus, Jesus said that I have to go to Jerusalem, I have to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders, I have to be crucified, and I will be raised from the dead. That's what he said. And Peter said, not, not so, Lord. I'll be persecuted for you. I will go to prison for you. I would even die for you, he said. And Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith might not fail. And when you have returned, which to me tells me he's going to depart, he's going to fail. When you have returned, Ready? Strengthen your brethren. You know why I love that? It's because the ingredients that made Peter bolder and louder for the truth of the gospel was the, uh, the shame and the guilt of denying his Lord and Savior. See, we often don't want to talk about those things in our past that produce shame. And I'm here to tell you those are the ingredients that God will even use to make you experience his grace even more. Some of you in this room, right here, right now, you've spent a life denying the Lord and you're teetering. You're on the edge of denying the Lord like a Peter to becoming a Judas that would completely betray the Lord. And the spirit is prompting you to put down your defiance and surrender all and give your life to Christ. Listen to me, lifestyles that have defied the Lord, denied the Lord, disobeyed the Lord, all of which leads to ruin, marital ruin, emotional ruin, circumstantial ruin. We know how this ended though, right? Jesus restored Peter. He restored him back to himself. And what I want you to hear right now is that Christ's dying is greater than your denying. And Christ being risen is greater than your ruin. So the answer is not regret. That's easy. The answer is repent. That today would be the day of salvation. Repentance is change your mind about who Jesus is. Paul continues. The verdict is in verse six to eight. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom 
The greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. What he's saying here is that 500 eyewitnesses all at once, so that nobody can be duped or deceived, saw the same risen Lord. This is remarkable. Two eyewitnesses in the court of law would be enough to substantiate the innocence or guilt of somebody on trial. 500 witnesses by which they would swear oaths to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In verse seven, he says, after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Who's this James? This James, as we know it, is the half-brother of Jesus, one of. Jude being the other noteworthy half-brother of Jesus. What you gotta understand is that James and his brothers and his siblings, they denounced their brother. They disassociated themselves from their brother. In Mark chapter three, you know what it says that Jesus' family thought of him? that he was out of his mind. Translation, he's a lunatic. Now, all of a sudden, James is in this line of witnesses? Oh yes, James went on to be one of the spiritual leaders at the epicenter of the church in Jerusalem. But more than that, James would eventually be martyred, killed for his faith and not his half-brother in the savior of the world. Why is this Significant, something radically altered these guys' ethos. Previously hiding and cowering in an upper room, now all of a sudden, they are bringing a public truth to the public square. I don't intend to give you a detailed autopsy of the causes of death of all the first century disciples, all of which, besides John, were killed as martyrs, some stoned, some hung, some clubbed, some stretched, some crucified, some speared, some burned, some beheaded like Paul himself. And oh, by the way, through the first century and beyond, and even up until today, the government, evil governments, were responsible for killing these guys. And oh, by the way, the government killed these guys not because they were minding their own business. The government killed these guys because they were minding heaven's business. And when you understand the greatest truth of all time, and you can't hold back, and you need to share it and live it, you are going to clash with the kingdoms of this world. And that is why God is currently looking for believers who are willing to live a life in complete honor to the Christ, to be willing to lose it all for all eternity's sake. The point is that the evidence of Christ being seen alive after his death is proved by those who gave up their lives for him unto death. But not just the men, even their wives and children, because they witnessed and saw with their own eyes the living Lord. Please note this. No one dies for what they know to be a lie. Did you get that? Nobody dies for what they know to be a lie. Why? Because our nature wants to self-preserve. People lie to stay alive They'll confess to something that isn't even true to spare their life. No one dies for what they know is a lie. And all of these guys and more through the ages gave up their life, including Paul, the writer of this letter in verse eight. He says, then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. This is significant. We know Paul as Saul He was a religious leader. We are introduced to him in Acts chapter seven where he is consenting to the first murder or martyr of Stephen and they're laying their coats at his feet. Saul was zealous for the law of God. In Acts chapter eight, it says he's breathing murderous threats and consenting to the incarceration and the deaths of those following the way, the early church. In chapter nine, however, something radically transforms him. You know what it is? The living Lord revealed himself to him. And what changed his trajectory, 
transforming one who was once a vicious persecutor of the church to a victorious preacher in the church. This Saul to Paul went from persecuting Christians to being persecuted as a Christian and eventually beheaded. See, this line between the cross and the tomb cannot be disconnected. This line between the cross and the tomb is the power that changes a Saul to a Paul. It's the power that changes a rebel to a disciple. It's the power that changes an atheist like C.S. Lewis, to a biblical apologist. It's the power that changes a sinner and the worst of them into a saint. This is the line. It's the line of duty. You're commissioning and you're charged as a believer from the Lord Jesus Christ is to live a life in honor of him. It's the line of demarcation. I don't know about you, but drawing that line in the sand, whether it's today and you say, the world is now behind me and the risen Lord is now before me. It's the line of thought even to which a guy like Job needed to hold to this lifeline. Do you know Job? He had lost 10 children, grief upon grief. Not long after that, he lost his possessions. Not long after that, he lost his own health. He doesn't know why this is happening. In fact, to make matters worse, to add insult to injury, his friends come. And instead of consoling him, they add more accusation upon him. Certainly, there's no way that a life would look the way it does unless God was judging that life. The tragedies that you are experiencing, the trials that you are facing must be the evidence that you are forsaken by God. And I say, nay, I say, no. For 19 chapters, Job wrestles, he struggles, he has doubts, he wonders, where is God in the midst of all of this? And right there, breaking forth in chapter 19, verses 23 to 25, he says this, oh, that my words were written, little did he know that they would be, oh, that they were inscribed in a book, and they are, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. The imagery is what they would do to a tombstone. They would engrave it with a lead pen so as to memorialize in stone someone's life, their birth and their death. He's saying he wishes there was an opportunity to engrave what he's feeling and what he knows. Well, what is it, Job? What is it you wanna say? What is it you want written down? What is it you want inscribed in your own book? Job, what is it that you want engraved in a rock? Verse 25, for I know that my redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. Church, you know what else would be written, inscribed in a book, engraved on a rock? You know why Jesus doesn't have a tombstone? Because the stone was removed from the tomb. And it is that rock that is forever engraved with the echo of a God who saves. And because I know personally my Redeemer lives, I will live to testify of my Redeemer. Because he lives, sin is forgiven. Because he lives, grace is given. Because he lives, death has been defeated. Because he lives, life is completed. Because he lives, every hurt can be healed. Because he lives, every wound can be sealed. Because he lives, every scar can be revealed. That's the gospel. The good news is not just that Jesus lived and died. The good news is that he died and now he lives. So I wanna make an appeal as a matter of truth. I want to ask you, do you know the greatest truth of all time? I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about memory. I'm not talking about going to church. I am not talking about your giving records. I'm not talking about your reputation in community. I'm not talking about your bank account. I am talking about whether or not you know that your Redeemer lives. And I'm here to tell you, you can know that you know 
your Redeemer lives. Do you know your sins have been forgiven? Past, present, future? That your wretchedness was exchanged for his righteousness? And that ultimately God deposits within your life his Holy Spirit presence. Do you have this? Do you know this? I think the greatest lie is that people can come in on a Sunday, especially on a day like today, and be fooled. And think because I know this story, I've heard this before, that they have somehow been saved. But a saved life reaps the fruit of repentance. Conversion is that I used to be this way and now I am entirely, uniquely different. I don't talk the same. I don't walk the same. I don't think the same. The Lord has taken my heart of stone and he's given me a heart of flesh and he has breathed in to my soul life and life abundant. So I'm asking, I'm appealing, I am begging, I am imploring. I'm not too dignified to do so. Do you know this Jesus I speak of? Can you say as you exit that your Redeemer lives? So I'd ask each of us in this room with heads bowed and eyes closed, If you've never made that decision, if you've never committed your life to Christ, if you've never, we say, invited him into your heart, this entire service is for you. The entire emphasis on the fact that your Redeemer lives So with all distractions set aside, is there anyone here who would like to give their life to Christ? Would you raise your hand? It's anyone who has never made that decision. You've never publicly proclaimed Jesus. You've never opened your heart, surrendered your life. Is there any? All you gotta do is raise your hand. God sees you. God is the one that sees and saves. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God is the one who sees and God is the one who saves. Is there anyone else? Thank you, I see you. You cannot rely You cannot rely on yourself. You cannot rely on the traditions of man. Is there anybody else? I want you to know that you can know your Redeemer lives. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray your sealing upon your people. I pray that they have made their decision in their heart, whether to receive you or even, oh God, your word allows man to reject you. And yet a decision has been made from every heart under the sound of my voice, as your word has been proclaimed, as your gospel has rang true, as Christ has died for our sins. And with the confession of faith, we recognize the cross was done by us. We receive the grace of what happened on the cross done for us. We understand you have been buried for three days and three nights, and that is where our sin lies. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you cast aside our transgressions. You've buried them at the depths of the sea. And here's how we know your word is true. Jesus rose from that grave. He is the God who saves. He is the God who sees. And we can proclaim and we can believe that our Redeemer lives. So would that be true this morning as we pray and as we say, amen.